Good evening, everyone. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about why I'm here and what my group has been doing in the last 10 years or so since we started at MIT. We've been investigating a set of materials that I'm really excited about, which are called metal organic frameworks. These materials are essentially sponges, but I like to call them sponges on steroids. And tonight I'm going to tell you why. So first, let's imagine what a sponge looks like. They're made up of some soft materials and interspersed with all of these little pores. Uh, metal organic frameworks, or MOFs, have essentially the same structure, but much, much smaller. They have pores just like sponges, but the pores in MOFs are absolutely tiny compared to regular sponges. In fact, while the pores of a sponge are about one millimeter, though pore, those in moths are about one nanometer, a million times smaller. That's about 100,000 times smaller than the width of a human hair. And only small molecules can fit inside these pores. The reason scientists get excited about these tiny pores is what it means for their surface area. So uh, let's imagine that you have a big cube where the side is, say, one meter. The inside surface area of this cube is squa six square meters because it has six faces. Now, if I fill that big cube with tiny cubes a single nanometer across, you can imagine the surface area will increase exponentially from that of, a, of the original six square meters. In fact, if you take just a teaspoon of one of these metal organic frameworks and laid it flat, the surface area would be large enough to cover an entire football field. I apologize, it's the Patriots football field. Um, this is what makes these materials extremely exciting. They literally have the largest surface area of any materials known. So what can you do with these sponges on steroids? Well, just like with regular sponges, you can put stuff in them. Okay? Scientists have been putting, using moths to soak up air, other gases, water for now 25 years. And they're really fantastic at doing that. For instance, everybody's concerned about CO2 today. The same gas that is warming the atmosphere can be used to manufacture chemicals or just make bubbly water. CO2 is stored in pressurized canisters. But if you first fill it with metal organic frameworks, you can take the amount contained in nine cylinders and store it all in the same volume and pressure as just one cylinder. So you can imagine that this is really exciting. People use these for, for gas storage or could in the future to uh, safely store hydrogen for fuel cell cars and so on. Now storing gases and liquids is great, but when I went to MIT, I wanted to explore something new, something else that uh, could be possible with metal organic frameworks. At that point, every MOF that had been created had been an electrical insulator, like ceramics or plastics. This means that if you were really adventurous and you wanted to plug in a lamp with a MOF cord, okay, um, it wouldn't light up. No electricity would flow because they're insulators. Makes sense, they're just filled with empty space. But after learning more about the electrical properties of materials, I began to wonder how could we take moths and make them as conducting as metal? Could we take a moth cord and make it behave like a metal such that it would light up the lamp? To do this, we had to think about exactly how moths are put together. So you can think of them as being put together of these little molecule segments where the heads of the segments are the metal, and then you have the organic linker similar to plastics between the metal groups, hence the name metal organic framework. Now we can put these segments together however we like. We can make one-dimensional chains, two-dimensional sheets, or even three-dimensional frameworks, or our sponges filled with tiny pores. Now, how exactly you connect these segments together is important because it determines the stability and, most importantly, how conductive the material is. So let's think about how to make MOFs conducting by looking at these individual molecules. For electricity to flow, we need charges. 
here negatively charged electrons to be able to move freely through the molecule. Now we can get charges in the metal and even in the organic strand, but they get stuck at the junction between the metal and the linker. So this junction is called a functional group. When I started my research lab, I wanted to find a way to clear this roadblock, which would make these super sponges electrically conducted. You might ask why? And my first answer is that it's just cool. How do you think about electricity, transporting electricity through materials that are mostly nothingness? The material, the percent filled space in one of these materials is literally less than 50%. So it's more so nothingness than it is matter. Now there are certainly exciting applications for conductive MOFs, which I'll get to, but it started really as an intellectual pursuit of how to make empty space conduct electricity. So to do this, our group went and dug through the literature to find a functional group that could conduct those charges. What we found led us to create this molecule, which when repeated over and over cre uh, again, creates a MOF sheet. This molecule has all the components, components we need, a metal, an organic linker, and most importantly, a functional group that can now conduct electricity. When we stack these sheets, we can get our sponge structure, except now we can get electricity to flow through it. I really couldn't believe it when my students first showed me the data. We'd taken that porous structure and we were able to conduct electricity through it. We essentially took the properties we wanted from insulators and conductors and made a whole new kind of material. That was really exciting and it opened up a whole bunch of new possible applications for us. The one I'll tell you briefly about is electrical energy storage. This is nothing new to anyone in this room. You all know about batteries, you all, know, care, you all carry a battery right now, probably, in your pocket or handbag. Batteries are great. They can store a lot of energy, but the problem is that they charge and discharge really slowly, which makes them difficult to use in certain applications, like powering cars. There's actually another device that can store energy. It's called a supercapacitor, which delivers charge in a very similar way, but can charge and discharge much more quickly. The downside to supercapacitors is that they can't store as much charge as batteries. So with a supercapacitor powered car, you could charge it really fast, but you couldn't get very far. Now, one way to improve both batteries and supercapacitors is to increase their internal surface area. The more surface area, the more energy you can store. Now that we have conducting MOFs, we can use their huge surface area on these devices. Putting MOFs in batteries, something we've done, can greatly increase their capacity, but this still doesn't solve the problem of slow charging and discharging. However, by putting MOFs in supercapacitors, you can keep the fast charging and discharging, but now store a ton more energy. So if we can make this supercapacitor, it might be able to store enough energy to power everyday devices. But this is all theoretical. So we set out to test this idea, whether MOFs could make good supercapacitors. So we built one, and long story short, these things work really well. The best way to show it is by demonstration. Here we made a simple device out of components just from Radio Shack, when it existed, uh, with the supercapacitor on top. My student is going to crank this shaft just to show you the light works on its own. And now that he's cranking it, he's also going to charge the supercap. So with each turn, he's building up the charge stored in the super cap to eventually power the light bulb on its own. When it lets the crank go, the light bulb is still going, as you can see, which means the energy is being supplied only from the charges that are being stored inside the MOF itself. So that's really exciting because we essentially took a set of materials that everyone will believe were complete insulators and made something that stores electrical charge and can power devices. Now that we know these work, what, can, what else can we do? Well, we can use them to power cars, and not just ordinary cars. As you saw in my video, we can use them powerful and expensive supercars like Lamborghinis. We've partnered with them, and they're using our supercaps in this concept car they want to build. 
The supercast will provide charge storage just like batteries do for a Tesla. This was unveiled at MIT a few years ago and is now an ongoing project. Once we demonstrate the principle of MOF-powered supercars, we can work to make MOFs cheaper and more accessible. Hopefully, come power your family car someday soon. So where else can we go? Now that we have these sponges that store electrical energy, we can do a lot of other things too. Another technology we've been able to make out of these is electrical cooling. I've actually co-founded a startup company called Transera to start making these. This innovation can provide the same cooling capacity as an average air conditioner, but with only about 50% of the energy. We're also making, looking at other applications like catalysis, using MOFs to catalyze new reactions, or to separate different gases. Really, the possibilities for conducting metal organic frameworks, now that we've made them, are pretty endless. And I couldn't be more excited about their future. With that, I want to thank my group. They're just a fantastic group of people. They often work better when I'm not at MIT. <laughs> so despite everything, this past year has been quite good for our science. Uh, they're doing even more things besides conducting models. I want to thank my sponsors. I mentioned Lamborghini, but also the Army Research Office and the Department of Energy have re been really critical in setting us up on this research. And I want to thank my family. They're a fantastic bunch themselves, and they keep me busy when I'm not doing chemistry. Um, finally, I want to thank the New York Academy of Sciences, the Blavatnik Family Foundation for this honor. This award doesn't just recognize our work, but the importance of curiosity-driven research in academia. It's truly incredible what science can happen when people are free to follow their curiosity. So thank you to the Academy, the Blavatnik Family Foundation, and Mr. Len Blavatnik. Thank you.